story of this old, old, rugged man um, who had lived this life of very much hardship uh, for the sake of Christ. He followed Jesus, but his life was just very difficult and laborsome. He, um, he faced mockery for following Jesus Christ. He lost influence. He lost money. He lost comfort. Um, he lost job promotions. He lost popularity. He lost friends. He lost a lot for the sake of following Christ. But the one thing he didn't lose was his hope. He had uh, been faithful to the Lord his, his life to the very, very end. Well, he's at home one day, and he hears a knock at the door, and he looks outside, and on his uh, front porch are two young, naive front porch evangelists. All right, So he goes and opens the door, and they're on the porch, and they exchange some pleasantries. Uh, and then they go in for the question. All right, you might know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've been hit before. They go in for the question, and they said, Sir, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And he said, would I go there? Son, I already live there. All right. Now, clearly he didn't mean that heaven was right there on the front porch of his little house there in the middle of the town. He didn't mean that. What he meant was that heaven was in him before it was a place that he was going to go to. He had the hope of heaven in the then and the now, and it was already inside of him, and he needed the hope of heaven. He had it, and I think if you're like me, I think we could all use the hope of heaven right now. I think we can all safely say that we need that. I, I, the, we've talked on and on about uh, globally how there's a slow-moving pandemic in our World. There's a uh, conspiracy theories, there's a cancel culture, um, there is uh, just a lot of political unrest. You guys know the things I'm watching. There's riots in the White House, and then they pray in the name of Jesus after they're done rioting the White House. If politicians being ushered into office, putting their hand on the Bible, God's Word... Swearing allegiance to it with the intention of turning around, implementing their own laws, and violating the very law of the Bible they just put their hands on. I'm talking a lot of approval of slaughtering of babies. I'm talking about a lot of things that are just really, really wacky with our world. Personally, uh, you might be experiencing some rioting in your own house. Increased argumentation, maybe with your spouse, your children are being a little rebellious. Uh, maybe you've walked through things like quarantine and, fa and failed quiet times. <laughs> uh, some of you have been sick. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you are battling the fear of getting sick and battling the fear of dying. There is a lot of reason uh, for there to be hopelessness in this world. So I, what I believe is very true, I believe this wise man was onto something, what we need now is heaven in us before we go there. If we have any hope of ever getting to heaven after we die, we have to get some heaven in us right now. If heaven's a place that we're going to stay, we need to visit it quite often. And that is exactly what chapter 4 and 5 do in the book of Revelation. They take us to heaven. But we said this last week, and just a gentle reminder, the hope is not in heaven itself. The hope is in who is in heaven, which is God himself. He is the gift of heaven. He is the source of where we get our hope. And last week in chapter 4, Jesus calls John up to heaven to get a perspective of the world from the view of heaven. It gives him a new, a new set of eyes to see the world. And he gets up there and there's this beautiful heavenly centerpiece. It's the throne of God, but it's not the throne of God that we're staring at. It's who's sitting on the throne. And we get this beautiful picture of God being sovereign and he's powerful and he's glorious. And what, what we got last week is this great big vision of a great big God. That's what John needed 2,000 years ago. That's what the church needed 2,000 years ago. That's what we need today, a great big vision of a great big 
God. Chapter 4 focused on God the Father. Today in chapter 5, really a continuation of 4, focuses on God the Son. And we're going to see this picture of Jesus today as a sacrificial lamb, but also this lording lion who, uh, who is both love and he's also just. And when we can look up upon Jesus as lion and lamb, then I think we can have this hope of heaven that we, we so desperately need. So let's look at it together. Revelation 5, we'll just walk through it. Um, as I was, I was thankful for Courtney and Stephanos doing that for us today, it's always good to put the word out there to lead us. Uh, but let's read this together, and starting in verse 1 through 4. Then I saw in the right hand of him, who is God the Father, who was seated on the throne, I saw a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So John sees this throne, sees God on the throne and sees in his right hand, he's holding a scroll. Well, in the ancient world, scrolls were used to seal up very important documents like titles or deeds or wills. They were sealed up with wax. And the only person that could open it up was someone who had the authority like the executor of the title or the deed or the will. And it had to be opened up in the presence of several witnesses. But what is this spiritual scroll? Some say that this scroll is the Lamb's Book of Life, which is in Revelation 13. If you don't know what that is, it's a book that we are told it was written before the foundation of the world. And in that book contains the names of all the people that God chose to save before the foundation of the world. I do not think that that is what this book is. We'll get to that later. What I think this book is, is what Daniel refers to in Daniel 12. God gave Daniel a vision, a prophecy and of the kingdom of heaven. And he called this book here that gave us the idea about the end of the world. He uses the language, actually, they're sealed up until the end of time. So let me see if I can make that more simplistic. In this scroll that is in the right hand of God, which signifies authority, it has seven seals. Seven is perfection, completeness. So in this scroll contains God's plan. The last days of history, the end of the earth, his will for his judgment against the wicked, his consummation and redemption of all of creation and all of his people that he chose to inherit the kingdom of God and the elect. That's, that's what is contained in this perfect scroll in the hand of God. The last days of hi human history, the end of the world, all right? That is what is contained in this scroll. You think about what that actually means. It's the end of all world wars. It's the end of all evil. The eradication of sin on the earth. The end of divorce. The end of cancer and abortion. And blatant sin against the holy God. It's the end of all of those things. It's the ushering in the new heavens and the new earth, the inheritance for the people of God. All of that contained in this scroll, but it will only come to pass if the scroll is opened by someone who is worthy. John hears an elder cry out, who is worthy to break the seal and open the scrolls? We've been singing that, right? And the answer is nobody. Nobody is worthy. 
in that moment, there was a universal search of heaven and earth, and no one was worthy to open it up. you got to think about who's present in heaven. The 24 elders are there, the 12 tribes, heads of the tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, they're there. They can't open it. Angels, archangels, unable to open it. The old saints, right? Noah, David, Moses, Abraham, all, all, all the heroes of the Old Testament, the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, Paul, they're all there. None are worthy to open up this scroll. What about people on earth? Maybe a president or a pope. A pope's holy guy, right? Maybe he can open the scroll. No, he cannot because he's a fallen man too. No one on earth or heaven was able to open up the scroll. The the world will not end as we know it. It'll just go on and on and on. This is why John wept. This is why he's crying. Because no one was worthy to open the scroll. The first thing I want you to see today is we're hopeless without Christ. Hopeless without Christ. You see, John knows that the scroll contains the judgment of God against the wicked. Like, if this scroll doesn't get opened, all of the injustice of this world against God, all the uh, the injustice against all Christians, none of it's vindicated. They don't have to pay the price for spitting in the face of God and for spitting in the face of God's people. There's no justice. There's no vindication whatsoever. John wants this to come to pass, but it cannot if it's not opened. Think about in that world that John was in. They had the Christians were scrounging around for bread while the wicked were eating fillets. Christians were living in hiding while the wicked were living in prosperity. They were winning, right? And he's just crying out injustice and injustice must come to an end. But there will be no justice if the scroll is not open. The other reason why John is weeping is because if the scroll is not open, there's no inheritance for God's people. All the things that this Bible tells us that we get to inherit as God's sons and daughters, we don't get any of it if the scroll's not open. There's no heaven for us. There's no new heavens and new earth. There's no peace with God. We never see the face of God ever and ever and ever. We do not get an inheritance. We just live and then we die. Life stinks, then you die. That's that's the hopelessness without Christ. That's why John's weeping. I believe these are not just John's tears. I think they represent all of our tears. If all the stuff in this world right now doesn't end, if all the wickedness of the world runs and rules and reigns and we lose and it just goes on and on and on and we just die and it's all over, That's hopelessness. Christianity doesn't even exist if this scroll isn't open. We've all been lied to, and we might as well just go home. But thankfully, this is not where John's vision ends. It goes on. Let's look at it together. Five through seven. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. The audacity of Jesus. In front of all those people, 
And he just strolls over and takes it out of the right hand of God. Either this is the dumbest thing in the world or he's God. See, God doesn't share the scroll with just anyone. Jesus was God himself. And he was worthy to take the scroll from the hand of God. Now, as we see this, one of the elders basically says, Stop your crying, John. Weep no more. There is one who's worthy. He has conquered. All right? That word conquered. Victory translated. It's the Greek word Nike, which is where we get the word Nike. Your shoes, your swooshes, your t-shirts, you see that. That means victory, right? So when you look upon another swoosh or a Nike, think, victory. That's Christ. He's the conqueror. He's the victor. All right, think about that word when you do that. He is the lion, first of all. It's the first thing we see here in the text. That Jesus Christ is this conquering lion from the tribe of Judah. That was a fulfillment of a messianic prophecy in Genesis 49. Jacob said that this Messiah would come as a lion's cub. All right? So now we're going to begin to see this Jesus as a lion. All right? Uh, think about the way that Jesus lived his life that might have been considered lion like. I mean, he was dignified, majestic. If you think about a a lion, and it's all—it's majestic. It's—it has dignity, right? It's not—it's not questioning who it is. Do you know what I mean by that? Like a lion's not sitting around saying, "I don't really know if I'm really the most powerful beast on the universe. I don't know if I'm the king of the universe of the animals." Like he knows who he is. Jesus, as the lion, knew who he was. He was confident in himself. He didn't suffer from identity am- amnesia. Like, he didn't fear if people liked him or not, or if he got enough approval or likes. Like, he knew who he was. He was like a lion, right? We know that he roared and flexed his lion-like power on the earth when he told the storm to shush. Or when he basically denied and shut the mouth of Satan in the wilderness. Remember when Satan was trying to tempt him? And he fought off Satan because he was a mighty, mighty lion. He, He fought against injustice as a lion. He came in and turned over the temple tables. Man, he was a mighty, mighty lion, roaring with power and majesty and honor. And of course we know that Jesus is the lion who conquered sin, death, the grave, Satan, all of it. Like we think about the cross as lamb, and he is. But on that cross, Jesus is saying, I'm the lamb, I'm a victor. I have conquered death, hell, and Satan. He is a mighty, mighty lion, church. We can't deny this aspect of who Jesus Christ is. In fact, he's a lion who will come to judge his enemies. He will come and he will do that. You guys know about a great movie, Chronicles of Narnia. And in that movie, there's a scene where there's a character, Mr. Beaver, is having a conversation with Susan and Mr. Beaver is trying to describe Aslan the lion to Susan and says it like this Aslan is a lion the lion the great lion he tells Susan she says oh said Susan I I thought he was a man is he quite safe for I would like to meet him Mr. Beaver said, safe? Who said anything about him being safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's a king, a good king. You think about that for a moment. If you are outside of Christ, you don't trust him, he isn't your Lord, he isn't your Savior, he isn't safe at all. He's a very dangerous lion, and he will come, and he will judge the wicked on these last days. But for those in Christ, he's a good king, a mighty, mighty good king. I think about, I was, I was writing through that this week, and I, there was a time when I took my kids to a, 
to a zoo when they were young. It was in Florida somewhere, and it was not like Tiger King Zoo. Like, it was a step up from Tiger King. It had like 12-foot uh, regular fences, just, just 12-foot fences like, you know, you'd have in your backyard. But it was 12-foot, so it was a little step up from Tiger King. But anyway, I was walking around, and I am not kidding you. I walked up, and from the back side of me, I was standing next to this. I didn't know what was in it, and a lion came running from behind. I was probably 10 feet, and this lion let out a roar like I'd never heard in my entire life. Just a chain link fence between me and this lion. Like, there was no question in that moment who was more powerful. It wasn't me. <laughs> right? I might have even peed myself a little bit. I don't know. But <laughs> my point is that Jesus is a lion, a mighty, mighty lion. I know we, think, we love to think about his qualities of being lamb-like, but we cannot deny the lionship of who Jesus is. Now, that's one aspect of Jesus. The other we see here is the lamb. 29 times in the book of Revelation, we see the word lamb describing Jesus. Well, remember John heard that this lion was coming. He said, it's a lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's thinking, lion, might. And then he looks over, and what he sees is a slaughtered lamb. It's not what he was thinking, I'm sure. So what is this idea? Why are we seeing this picture of Jesus as this slaughtered lamb. If you know your Old Testament, Jesus was the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus. God's wrath was coming through Egypt. He says to those, the Israelites, if you'll take a lamb and you slaughter and wipe the blood over the doorpost of your house, I will pass over you. That was a, a picture of Jesus Christ being the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. In the Old Testament, Jewish people who wanted their sins forgiven, here's what they had to do. If you know a little bit about Old Testament history, they would have to take an innocent lamb, a spotless lamb. They would take it before the priest. And in that moment, they have a priest, you have the lamb, you have the, the sinner. And what they do in that moment, they confess their sins before the priest. And then what happens? The priest slits the throat of the lamb, blood is pouring out. And what it is said in that ritual, what's happening is the sins of the sinner are being transferred to the innocent lamb, forgiven. This is a picture of Christ. The sinner stands before a holy God, confesses our sin, past, present, and future. And for those that do that, all of your sin in your whole life is transferred to the innocent lamb who is Jesus Christ. Forever, done, never to come back again unclean. That is a pretty amazing exchange, wouldn't you say? All your guilt, all your shame, everything you've ever thought of wicked in your entire life, all your web history, every time we've lusted, angered, gossiped, whatever, every single thing transferred to the only innocent person that ever walked the face of the earth. You and I, if you're in Christ, you get to stand before God as if you were Jesus himself because Jesus himself stood in front of God as if he were you. This is beautiful gospel. He is the lamb. We know that Isaiah 53 said he was the promised lamb that would be led to the slaughter. In his life, he comes on the scene, right? He's birthed in the world. He's like a, he's like a little lamb incarnate. He's, a, he's in a manger. He's very gentle. He's very meek. He's very humble, right? He comes on the scene and John the Baptist says, he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Children love to be around him. He's very lamb-like, serving his brothers, washing their feet. Very lamb-like, laying himself out. Lived a life very lamb-like. And then ultimately, yes, the lamb was led to the slaughter on the cross. No one put him there. It wasn't Rome. It wasn't the soldiers. It wasn't Caesar. It wasn't Pilate. He laid on the cross himself to be the once and for all sacrificial 
lamb to pay for the sins of God's people. He was both lion and he was lamb. Something else I want you to see, I saw this in the text this week, is that John looks at the lamb. It says he was slain, but yet he's still standing. Slain, but standing. This is a representation of the death of Christ, but then resurrected to new life. He now stands up. Another thing to think about through here. This is Jesus again in the full glory of heaven. We would think, in my mind, perfect, spotless, flawless Jesus. But... He still has the appearance of a slain lamb. Why is that? Remember when the resurrected Jesus appeared to his disciples and Thomas in his unbelief said, look. Jesus said, look at my hands. Look at the holes. They're still in my hands. He still bore the marks of the crucifixion. Why did he do that? Why did he do it then? And why is he in heaven still bearing the marks of the crucifixion? Because he doesn't want you or me to ever, ever, ever forget the cross. That's why. Don't ever forget what I had to go through to save you. Don't ever forget how much I love you. My wounds are the trophies of my love for my people. His wounds were also trophies of his victory. You ever know a soldier, someone who maybe fought in the war, and they have battle scars? They love to tell you about it too, right? Look at my scars. We won. Look at this. That's what Jesus is doing here. Look at my wounds. They're victor's wounds. Don't ever forget my love for you and the victory that I accomplished on the cross. See, slaughtered lambs don't stand up. (laughs) Typically, they don't. But this Jesus is a different lamb. He is a lion, he is a lamb. Now, let me, let me move forward. We've seen a picture, a twofold coin of who Jesus is, lion and lamb. And because he did all of those things, he now is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls. That's why we've been singing each week on repeat. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Yes, he's worthy because he's a lion and he's a lamb. Let's look at the third piece here. Hope in Christ leads to the worship of Christ. Verse 8 through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. As soon as Christ took the scroll out of the Father's hands, it turned from wonder to worship. Now, I'm going to push pause for just one moment to make one statement. Jesus has not opened the scrolls yet. What he will do in chapter 6 through 22. He will begin to open the scrolls and judgment will unfold. But he hasn't done it here yet. He just has the scroll. He's picked it up. And what begins to happen is a worship service. You have the 24 elders. You have the four creatures. They've got these harps and they have these bowls which contain 
the prayers of the saints. These bowls, symbolic bowls, are are producing an aroma in heaven. Prayers of the saints. Think about that for a moment. How amazing that is. Every single time you have wet your pillow with a prayer. Begged God for this or for that. He's storing up every one of our prayers. And he's using them for one day when we get to heaven. And they will be in this figurative bowl. And they will be at the feet of Jesus as we worship him. I don't even know what that looks like. Like That just blows my mind. I think it's probably like uh, maybe heaven's version of the essential oils or something. I don't know. But it's awesome. It's just this aroma of heaven. The prayers of the saint. They're busting out. In this worship service. And they sing. Here's what they sing. They sing a new song. And the reason they sing a new song is. There's two reasons we are told they're singing a new song. The first one he says. That he's singing. Because he ransomed a people by his blood. From every tribe and language and people and nation. That's why they're singing. Think about that for a minute. The key word is ransomed. It means purchased. He didn't pour out his blood on the cross in the hopes that some might be saved. He purchased those who the Father chose before the foundation of the earth. That is who he bled for. Think about this for just a minute. Let me use an illustration. I will sometimes, uh, me and my wife, Callie, will eat, uh, and we're hungry. We're sending my son out to go get us something at the drive-thru. He still loves to drive. He's 17, you know what I mean? They get their cars and they'll do anything. Hey, bud, go get us something to eat. Sure, we'll go. So he goes, and we send him with a list. This is exactly what we want to eat. He goes, he picks up the meal, and he gets exactly what's on the list. I hope so, but let's just use it for illustration's sake. He gets exactly what's on the list. He comes home and he gives his father what was on the list. That is exactly what happens in salvation. Jesus Christ, with his blood, purchases those who were on the father's list, the Lamb's book of life in Revelation 13. That should make you burst forth in praise. If you know what the Bible says, actually, not what someone told you, but if you know the Bible says that you are undeserving of God's grace, you don't merit heaven whatsoever, you deserve his wrath, and instead he puts you on his list and chooses to save you, right? That is amazing. That's one reason to sing and worship Jesus. The other reason we're told here that they sing is because they have made him a kingdom and priest To our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What does that mean? The reason we sing is because we not only reign now, we will also reign later. It's a now and not yet reigning. Now, some of you might be saying, it doesn't look like Christians are reigning on this earth. I mean, if you looked at the news sometimes, and and yes, I would agree with you from appearance sake, it doesn't look like we're reigning at all. And some people don't understand what reigning truly means. And so what they do, they're looking for a political savior to save America because they believe that reigning means we have to occupy all positions of authority and power on the earth, like governmental seats, oval offices, mayors and presidents and governors. They think that we have to do that or we're not reigning. That is so far from the truth. God's kingdom is not of this world. And he isn't limited by people sitting on a seat in order for his kingdom to reign on earth. Would it be great to have some Christians sitting in office? Absolutely. I'm all for it. We should have more Christians run for offices. But that is not how the kingdom of God has to be ushered in. It's not by saving America. It's by saving people one soul at a time. That is how the kingdom of God is ushered through the world. And that is how we reign on earth when we share the gospel with people everywhere we go. And that's important. 
It's very, very important because, like I said, there's a lot of people out there that want a political savior so bad, so, so bad. Instead of hoping and praying for America to be saved, let's pray and hope that God would save our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, the people in our church. That is for reason to sing. Now, the other reason here, it's not just right now that we reign. We will reign in the future in a new heaven and a new earth. When this world ends, and it will end, new heavens and a new earth. Who will populate the new heavens and the new, new earth? All Christians. All people who love God will govern the earth. You just even think about what that looks like. Everywhere you go, people love Jesus. No opposition, no kickback, no disobedience, no nothing, no tears, no cancer, no what. It's all just good, right? We will reign in the new heavens and the new earth. How this chapter ends, it ends with all of creation, heaven, earth, myriads of thousands and thousands, the elders and living creatures, all bowing down and worshiping Jesus. This is the largest worship gathering ever. This is big church. (laughs) We need to be careful sometimes. We talk about big church in a bad way. There are bad big churches. But in the kingdom of heaven, there'll be big church. All right, so it can't be bad all the time. Let's remember that. And then now we see, let me tie this thing together. Let me see if I can do a little bit of a recap here and, uh, and then try to land this thing with some application. The first thing I want just to recap is this. Your life, this world, is hopeless without Christ. Now, if you're sitting there, some of you are nodding, you're like, yep. Some of you, let's be honest, you're sitting there saying, that's a pessimistic point of view. Golly, you Debbie Downer, what are you doing up here today? I'll go somewhere else to feel better. My, that's what you're thinking right now. You think, I'm pretty good, man. I don't know what you're talking about, hopeless. You ought to see my bank statement right now. I have an awesome family. Kids are doing great. I've got a great 401k. i got this awesome house. This great new car I got. It's got heated seats. I'm doing pretty good. Listen. You can have everything that this world has to offer. If you do not have Christ, you have nothing. That's me loving you. I know it doesn't feel that way. I want you to see the impotence of every single thing that this world has to offer that's not Jesus. It will never never satisfy you. It will never fulfill the longing In your heart. Only Jesus can do that. Without Jesus, you, like John, will weep. You'll weep on earth and you'll weep in eternity without Christ. But for those who believe in the lion that Jesus is, the lamb that Jesus is, you will hear the words weep. No more. Weep no more. The kingdom of heaven is promised to you. You have hope in this world. And you have the inheritance of heaven. All these beautiful promises. I want you to know that. And if you're following with me, the response proper is worship. Worship of Jesus Christ is the response here. Everybody worships, by the way. God made us worshipers. Made us to worship him, and we know that we all fall and worship other things. Worship is whatever we go to or whoever we go to for satisfaction, pleasure. What that thing is or that person that gives us that, that is what we worship. Sin makes us worshipers of other things. Then all of a sudden we have an encounter with Christ, then we become worshipers of Jesus. So why is it Christians fail to worship Jesus as we ought to? Why is there sometimes half-hearted obedience or 
Like I occasionally worship here, but I'm really not really on fire for Jesus. That's for radical people. Why is it that people don't worship Jesus like he demands for us to worship? I think it's because of lopsided views of Jesus. Some people only want lamb Jesus. Sacrificial, full of grace, full of mercy, turning a blind eye to sin, dusting it under the rug, loves all people. He just has this wonderful plan for your life if you would just please pick him. I'll call them Loveites. All they see is the love and the lamb of Jesus. That's part of him. And if that's, that's the way you see Jesus primarily and you neglect the lion's side, then that's what you'll portray to people. You'll just go around all the time. Jesus love. You won't speak truth into people. You won't warn them of the lion that's coming because you only see one side of Jesus. While others only want lion Jesus. This judge Jesus, right, who's going to execute uh, justice on the world. He's going to pour out his wrath on the wicked. Everybody who's wronged us and wronged the world, they just constantly think into this judge, judge Jesus. Well, what that ends up turning us into is a bunch of judgmental whistleblowers, fault finders and people. Ah, oh, look at them. Can you believe what they're doing? Oh, Jesus is really going to get them, right? We go around, we do that, and we forget this lamb-like quality of Jesus Christ, full of mercy, full of grace. In order to properly worship Jesus, we must worship both sides of the coin. Love and justice, lion and lamb. That's how we worship Jesus. So if that's the way we have to see him first, how do we physically worship Jesus in our life? What does that look like? Worship is a big vague word. I'm going to try to put some legs on it for just a moment. We've talked about corporate worship. We've been talking about that regularly because the Lord's Day, what we do in here on Sunday, is heaven's rehearsal. We've watched corporate worship happen here. So this is what we do. This is a way that we worship Jesus through corporate worship on Sunday. But think about this for a moment. If all we do is worship in this place one day a week, no one out there cares anything about us. They don't pay attention to that. They don't care that we're in this building this morning. But if you worship Jesus seven days a week, they will take notice of your life. They will pay attention. And this Jesus will become real. We worship Jesus through obedience. We worship him by coming here on Sunday. We worship him with our life. We worship him with our time. How we spend our time through the week. If you were to take your calendar on your phone and present it to someone who didn't know you, would they be able to look at your calendar and say, that person follows Jesus. I can see it. They've got Bible study on Saturday mornings. Uh, they have quiet time here. They're going to their life group on Thursday night at 6. Your schedule, your time, that's how you worship Jesus. You worship Jesus by serving Jesus. You, you don't just come to church to consume a sermon and song. You serve. That's how you worship Jesus. And some of you worship Jesus every week so well, you leave this worship venue and you go into another worship venue and you serve and you do many things for the Lord. Some of you don't worship Jesus by serving. You just come here and your worship is contained. And you need to take that blue card and you need to worship Jesus by serving his bride. That's the church. Not for life point. Do that for the Lord. That's how you show him that he's worthy. You also worship Jesus with your money. If someone were to look at your bank statement, would they be able to tell that you love Jesus more than your money? You might say, that's hard to tell. Start by looking at your tithe, your statement. Does it show that you tithe to the bride of Christ, you, to God? You give back to him a tenth the way he gave to you 100% anyway? Well, if it doesn't show that, Jesus isn't worthy of your worship. You love money more than Jesus. It's, it's, it's not hard. It's not complicated. We show who we worship by our 
obedience. And it's always, remember, for our good and for his glory. So are you worshiping this lion, this lamb? Another way that we worship Jesus, listen, is you share the hope of heaven in a hope-starved world. You know what I mean? Like, if we find ourselves being sucked into the negativity of the world, and all we're doing is going around complaining, 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 man, we're contributing to the hopelessness of the world. If you believe these things, you must Share the hope that is inside of you. So the next time you either find yourself or hear someone else saying the words, what is this world coming to? You can tell them this, an end. That's what it's coming to. It's coming to an end. And if you know Jesus Christ, it's going to be amazing. New heavens, new earth, inheritance is all yours. What a great opportunity to share the gospel with people. We have the hope of heaven inside of us. Share it with the ones that you love, your neighbors, your co-workers. All right. If you're here today um, and you do not know Jesus Christ, clearly he's the centerpiece of all of our worship services. If you do not know him as your Lord and your Savior today, I pray I pray that you move. Only God can move you. It's not me or my words. I pray that he does. You fill out a card. You come see us after service. You contact us this week. We want to help you process these deep things. If you have confusion, come talk to us. The way we're going to conclude our time together today, you know, we've talked about how this book is a symbolic book. Maybe it's full of symbols and signs over and over and over again. And so what we're going to do today is we appropriately talk about the lion and the lamb, we're going to end uh, by practicing what is another symbol of something greater. It's called the Lord's Supper or communion. If you have those, go ahead and get those out. This cup, which is really our cups we're using for the COVID season. Y'all know these things. You have to, for safety standpoint, when this whole thing's over, we're going to get some new communion in here. You guys are going to love it. Uh, But this is, number one, it's not a plaything. It is symbolic of the broken body of Jesus Christ. The slain lamb that was poured out, his blood purchasing you. So not literally, clearly, but symbolically it is. And we're we're told to do this. Over and over and over again until when? Until all of this comes to the end. And then what we'll be able to do? We put these little communion crackers down. Never ever again will we have to eat an appetizer because we'll be eating this massive feast in heaven forever and ever. But until then, we do this. So if you're a believer in the room, I'm going to give you a moment to ponder sin, harboring sin, some habitual sin in your life that you know that you just, man, you just know it's got a grip on you and you're not fighting it. Lay that before the Lamb. Have confidence that He paid the full price for it and now fight it, engage it, and turn and repent. That's the beauty of the gospel. If you're not a believer in the room, The scriptures would say, do not do this today until you profess Jesus Christ as your both lion and lamb. You would hold off. If you want to talk about that afterwards, I'll be happy to speak with you about that as well. I'm going to give you a moment for reflection, and then I'll come back up and I'll lead us through.
the night before the lamb would be led to the slaughter. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, we have the hope of heaven inside of us. Let us go be a light to the world. Give them a picture that we've been given. And love you guys. Let's stand. Let's worship. See you guys next week.